Well, good morning. Ed here from Crystal Clear Aquatics. And today we start yet another pond restoration. This is a back-to-back -back job. We've spent the last three weeks working on some work local to me, doing a, a pond from scratch. And having just completed that, we're now coming straight onto another site to start to restore and reline an existing pond. Now the challenges with this one are that there's no direct access straight to the back garden. Everything is going to have to be taken by hand straight through the house. That means all the digging, all the stone, all the aggregates, all the materials, everything carried by hand in buckets. Yeah, it's going to be a laborious job. It's a lovely day. I've got Dave with me straight away at the beginning of the job. So right now, we're just unloading the van, setting up base and getting all of our kit taken up into the garden. Don't make a mess with the house, will you? No, try not to. <laughs> Please just dry. So this is the pond in question. And this is what we're going to be working on for the next few weeks. And the brief of this job is the simplest, it's a reline. It's a very old pond liner. And although there's not any issues just yet, there's a couple of holes that have started to appear up in the shallows. Um, it's at some stage in the very near future, it'll end up catastrophically failing. So before we get to that stage, we're relining the pond. And in the process, this is a good opportunity to do a few improvements to the pond, chiefly increasing the depth, it's a little bit too shallow, and to do the typical kind of interior rock edge so that we can lose that visible strip of pond liner, which is always evident. So that's gonna involve digging out Bit of a rock shelf increasing the proportions of the pond slightly to accommodate that this grid is going to be going it's served its purpose it was here initially for a bit of child safety let's see if i trust my weight to it that's the idea there we go so this is it's a very good system actually safer pond safa safer pond was one of the first manufacturers of this grid and they're um a good system of plastic grids and aluminium supports that can be trimmed and cut to shape to fit any shape pond and you can position the grid so that they're above the surface of the pond or fractionally below the surface of the pond. Now the grid work has been a very convenient sort of heron deterrent but it has a disadvantage it shades the pond massively it really detracts from the overall sort of focal point of the pond so this is something that's going to be going and well, the process, obviously, increasing the depth of the pond is going to be a natural way then of providing a little bit more cover for the fish and making it a bit harder for a heron or any other predators from, uh, from getting the fish. So initial stages are going to be draining the pond down, setting up the usual holding tanks and water reservoirs. There's a very large grass carp in here, 14 or 15 inches in size. Um, currently can't see him against the black pond liner, but he's in there somewhere. He's not going to be returning to this pond, he's a bit too big for this. So we're going to find a, a home for him and take him away this morning straight away. And then it's going to be setting up all our equipment and starting to make a mess. Now again, alongside the disadvantage of having to run everything through the house, we've also got this lovely well landscape garden, which is almost exclusively gravels and chippings. There's not really any soil or borders or grass anywhere where we can lose silt and debris and dirt and muck. So we're going to have to be very, very clean on this job and make sure that everything is taken through, even all the wet stuff, in buckets so we don't make a mess. And just simple things like setting up the gazebo, piling up all our equipment, it's just made that a little bit harder because we haven't got big open spaces to deal with. But we'll get there. As long as the weather holds out, then uh, we'll, we'll get there. Now, some of you may recognise this garden from a video I did a little while ago, which was the maintenance of an Awaza Filtermatic. And the filtration system has been running on this pond very successfully, doing a lovely job of keeping the pond nice and clear. So this stream was something that I put in a few years ago. You can see how nicely established it is now with one of my favourite staple plants that I use around water, which is the Mind Your Own Business. And look how lovely and 
softening it is on the stonework here, this lovely kind of fluffy cushion of growth. It's a great plant to have just to creep over the stonework like this. Beautiful. But in the process of relining the pond, this lower section of stonework and cascade is going to have to be removed so that we can get a proper overlap of pond liner. I've just seen a sight of the grass cart. He is enormous. Probably more like 20 to 24 inches. He's going to be a handful when we take him out. Now apologies if you notice a difference in sound quality. Unfortunately my GoPro external mic has failed yet again. GoPro are on the case and sending me another one. Very frustrating. It's the second time in about 10 months that's happened. So I'm relying on the internal mic on the GoPro camera, which isn't that fantastic, especially when there's any wind. So apologies in advance. But we better crack on, stop filming and get on with the job. Right, that's the grid off. Now it's time to catch Howard the grass cup. And the best way to do this is to get him in a nice soft sheet wrap him up and I'll carry him through into the holding tank. But he is going to splash and flap. He's gonna be a, he's a big powerful fish. I reckon he's probably two foot, 24 inches from nose to tail. This reminds me of years ago. Were you with me when I caught a six foot sturgeon wrapped up? Yeah. yeah. I'd like to keep some of this dry so I don't end up dripping water all the way through your house, Chris. There he is. On you go. It's a lovely fish. Okay, can you, you can't see anywhere? Or his nose or anything sticking out? No. Nope. Okay, good. Okay, right. This is where Howard's going. Let's carefully pick him up. What a lovely fish. Yeah, he's got to be 26, 27 inches, I reckon. Lovely fish. So he's off to a new home. So I've been gone 25 minutes. Howard the carp has gone over to the water gardens and he's very happy in a nice big holding tank. And I've come back to find Dave has done most of the job. So he's removed all of the stone moat around the edge. All that grid's gone, the slabs have been lifted. Where did you find all the time for that? Plants have all gone. Plants have all gone, so we've now got to get the fish out. And they're going into the tank at the bottom. And then we can continue to empty the pond. And get this liner out. And have a look and see what we're dealing with with the ground beneath. So it's fish catching time. Looks distressing to see the fish floundering around like this, but it's much, much easier for me and less stressful for the fish if we try and catch them where there's very little water in the pond. So we've got some lovely big golden rud here, some gold fish, and one green tent. And these are all going to spend the duration of the job in a little holding tank, which is going to be aerated. Whoa, there's a face full. So they're out of harm's way. There we go. Look at this beautiful, beautiful green tench. Lovely fish. Sadly, he's got a couple of possible internal tumours, lumps and bumps, but nothing of concern. They're such a beautiful fish though, green tench. I love this 
very small scale pattern and the colours. Let's see if we can get him a bit closer to the camera. Gorgeous fish. Now tensioned and carp and fish in general, they always seem to be a little bit more docile and a bit calmer when you're holding them if you keep a finger in their mouth or just in front of their mouth. Lovely fish. Tinker Tinker, the green tench. So I'm using my handy Awaza Pondavac 5 here to, to do the suction on this very shallow water. It's too shallow for my pump to prime and to work. So the vacuum works very well for that. Okay Dave, up with the net please. So we've got a couple of stragglers left. And one frog. And that's it for the livestock. Now the frog I'm not gonna put in the in the tub. No, I'm gonna put we haven't got any grass. Well, in the I'm gonna put the frog in the plants, so he'll be quite happy. So this is a slightly delicate area of the pond to attend with we need to remove this lower section of the cascade so that we can ensure that the new pond liner overlaps correctly with the cascade lining that's the that's the cascade lining that's here or the stream lining and this is the old pond lining over here so in removing these stones and breaking away some of the mortar and concrete bits and pieces i have to be very careful not to damage the existing stream liner because that is going to remain in situ we're not replacing that if you were to replace it all of the stone would have to be removed so i need to be careful with this now i prefer to try and keep all the spill stones intact but if i end up breaking them in the process it's not the end of the world i'll have plenty of other materials to replace that with there we go straight away broken so these are very old thin Horsham stone tiles uh, in this area of West Sussex. Traditionally, Horsham stone was used to tile some of the older properties. And these are really, really thin pieces of stone which can be very fragile. That one's come away okay. This is where you get a lovely shot at the back of my head. Try and remove all of this and these lower sections here and here. Now, when I built this stream originally, all of the stonework had been positioned on secondary offcuts of pond liner, and that's going to make removal of this old mortar and stone an awful lot easier. And that's a very, very good reason for doing so in the future. Never lay stone cemented into place directly on top of the main pond liner. If you're doing this at home where I wear high protection, I'll be very lazy, but I should go and get some glasses really. So, that's the lower section of the stream that's been dealt with and removed. So some of the edging stones and the spill stones have been taken away and all the mortar and bits and pieces that were holding it together to reveal a loose end of the cascade liner. And that means that when we lay the new pond liner, we can get a good overlap, positioning the pond liner underneath, overlaying it with the cascade liner, and making sure that the water from the stream is gonna flow into the pond and not leak anywhere. The rest of the pond has been dealt with, all of the edging stones have been removed, um, fleece, various bits and pieces have been taken out. We're now down to the, the full excavation of the pond. We have to start doing some digging. 
Now the idea on this is that we need to make the pond a lot deeper. It's too shallow, so we need to go down at least a spade depth or about a foot or thereabouts in depth. Um, and we're also going to very, very slightly change, not so much the shape of the pond, but we're going to be altering the, the second shelf here. We don't need any of this. I'd rather have a few zones like I do when I'm building ponds where we can have some dedicated planting zones, some marginal zones, rather than having an area where we just balance plastic baskets of, of plants. So there's going to be a big area here where there was once a beach. There will still be a beach, but this will be an area which will be more, rather than cobbles, it'll be a typical kind of gravel area that I can then plant up into as well. Um, to create our rock shelf, the pond dimensions will have to increase at least as wide as the collar of stone so that we're not reducing the footprint and the size of the pond. Obviously, if we were to start building up stone here to conceal that inside edge of pond line that would be visible, all we'd be doing is reducing the pond size, the pond footprint, by the width of the stone all the way around. So to allow for that, we have to dig out as well the width of the stone. So this portion here all the way around will be dug out down to about the level of this shelf. We'll make sure that it's uniform and level all the way around. We'll dig out the depth of the pond a little bit deeper. And then once we've done that, we can then start to incorporate and build and dig out the areas that will become the marginal zones. Now what we have to be very cautious of here is that we don't go too mad in increasing the volume of the pond, the size of the pond, because that in turn is going to have repercussions with the filtration system that's here. Now we've got a good filtration system and this is something that was only replaced two or three years ago. So it's not something that we want to spend large sums of money on upgrading again. We'd like to keep it for the new pond. So an increase in volume probably of, I reckon, another couple of hundred gallons or so, um, a thousand litres or thereabouts. I think it's going to be perfectly reasonable and not putting too much of an extra demand on the filtration system. It's not a very heavily stocked pond either, but we don't want to go too much more than that. Now, as for the digging, I'm not sure if I've got the short straw or not, but Dave's going to be in the pond digging out and I'm going to be the one outside in a pair of clean shoes ferrying all the spoil in buckets down to the skip. I want to make sure that we're as clean as possible going through the house. Um, any mess is just something that's going to have to be cleared up afterwards. So just being cautious here and taking it slowly, I think is the way forward. So, time to get dirty and dig in. That sounds terrible, doesn't it? <laughs> time to get dirty and dig in. Aha. <laughs> My arms are going to feel this at the end of the day. Only a few more hundred of these to go. Another day, another dollar per sun cream. Seem to get through an awful lot of this. Too much, Dave? Sorry? Too much? Just a little. <laughs> Certainly compared to what I use. <laughs> yeah, Dave doesn't use any sun cream. Or a bit of olive oil, isn't it, for yeah, building up true. your turn? Yeah. You've got to look after yourself. Reminds me of holidays though, something I've not had for a very long time. So if you kind of pretend the smell of the sun cream and the sound of the water, you could be on the beach. Close your eyes? Yeah, close your eyes. Getting tired of digging yet, Dave? Nope, totally enjoying myself. You tired of digging yet, Dave? No, not at all. Tired of digging yet, Dave? No, not at all. <laughs> Hi, 
Not out of digging yet, Dave. Not yet. Well, I'm getting tired of these bucket runs. So what does that mean? It means it's nearly home time. Hooray, that's pretty much it for the digging. There's a few loose bits and pieces that are going to have to be attended to and a few edges that are going to have to be neatened up. But we're certainly now at a position where we can get the measure out, measure up for the pond liner and know exactly the sort of measurements we need for the lining and for the fleece. Every time I do this, I mention that there's a formula. I'm not going to go on about the formula. I always like to measure up, do it properly with a tape measure, which if you've seen any of my videos, you've seen me do multiple times. I'm not going to go into too much of an explanation here, but I'm going to essentially measure, following the contours, the maximum length and the maximum width, allowing a little bit of overlap all round as well. So let's start this end. I'll go do the width first, go on then. Just allow me... Yeah, no, sorry about that. Thank you. So we're going from the widest point of the pond. And look, having an extra pair of hands does make a massive difference. Normally I've got stones and weights and bits and pieces holding this down. But instead, I've got a Dave. Five meters 70. Yep. Bang on. So it's a theoretical liner size of 5.7 by 4.10. Um, of course, there's no guarantee that any liner supplier is going to have exactly those measurements. It may well be that it will be a 6 metre roll by 4.10 um, or a 5.7 by 4.5, something like that. But as always, I should be using Gordon Lowe, very, very good manufacturer and supplier of pond liners and fleece. Um, I'll give them a call first thing in the morning and we'll get this ordered up. So, first job this morning is I want to rig up a little filtration system for the fish in their holding tank. Um, now usually if I was using one of my big sort of frame pools as the holding tank I'd probably rig up an external filtration system, something with a submersible pump um, and a pressurised external filtration system outside but as the fish are being kept in a very very small container it's a little bit overkill um, and much simpler for me just to drop in an all-in-one filtration system so I'm using um, an Awaza Filtral this is a Filtral 3000, which has got an integrated 9 watt UVC, and that's going to be more than enough for my very small volume of water in that little rigid tub to keep that nice and clean and clear. Um, I am, of course, aerating the, the tub as we speak at the moment, but I think the fish are going to be in here for a few weeks. Um, much better to add some filtration in there as well so that we can continue to feed the fish. Um, and it will keep the water a little bit cleaner as well. I've deliberately chosen the smallest unit that they do in the filtral range. Uh, I'm not that fussed about UVC rating, to be honest, although 9 watts is going to be more than enough for a little tub like that. But more importantly, I wanted to make sure that we had a form of biological filtration to make sure that we can process some of the waste that's going to be produced in that tub. And already, in the couple of days that the fish have been in there, the water's already clouded over. This is a nice little neat unit, small and compact, a little submersed pump, with some basic biological media and some mechanical media with some open cellular foams and then we've got an integrated submersed 9 watt UV in there as well. There's a little window that illuminates to show you that the UVC is working and as standard you get 10 meters of cable fitted as well. So I'm just going to fit a plug on the end of this, plug it in and drop it into the tub. And there we go, that's the plug on the end. Now, you get very basic fittings with the filter or standard, and it's just a standard hose tail, so that if you wanted to run some flexible hose, so that this could discharge off via a small trickle of a cascade stream, little amphora on its side pouring water, something like that, it could be used as a feature. But in this application, I'm just literally gonna drop it in the bottom of the tub, let it circulate as it is. So I'm not even gonna worry about adding the hose tail. Something I am gonna do though, is I want to activate the filtration system and try and get it to mature and establish as quickly as possible to provide as good an environment as possible for the fish. So I'm going to put inside the filter a couple of these small duo boost um, balls, again made by Awaza and Evolution Aqua also makes a really really good, very very similar 
um, gel balls called pond bombs and these are very 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 beneficial saturated in nitrifying bacteria and essential minerals in the pond they look very cool normally I use the, the big ones and just sort of chuck a whole pond bomb in a pond but in this I'm just gonna drop a couple of these beads directly into the filtration system I think I'll probably pack them between the sponges like so now it does come with a little mesh bag but I don't want to use the whole lot in here just a couple of beads is going to be plenty Reassemble that, and I shall also pour a little bit of this liquid directly into the tub as well. There we go. So I have just dropped in the filter onto the bottom of the tub here. You can see that little window by my thumb glowing purple. That's showing that the UV is working. And we'll just let it circulate like that in the water. Give it a week. And that will be nice and clear. Now one other job that I've come to do this morning is that during the next few days whilst we wait for the pond liner and fleece to arrive, I can't leave the marginal plants just sitting around in the garden. It's going to be dry, there's no rain forecast uh, and they're going to end up worse for wear as a result. So I've come with some tubs and some crates this morning. I'm going to give some of these plants a bit of a cut back, um, hang on to a few salvageable bits and make sure that they're sat in some water for the duration of the job surrounded in a, a marginal jungle so I've got a few plants here to deal with everything looks massive they've really got overgrown in these containers but we've got a large pot here of some iris versicolor American flag iris a nice purple iris um, just finished flowering they always look a little bit scrappy at this time of year a big clump of bog bean Minianthus trifoliatus that's one of my favorite Latin names of plants I think it's a very very descriptive name for this plant it's like a giant three-leaf clover so I'm never going to get that in the tub like that either I'll give that a good cut back it's got a small calpha palustris a marsh marigold but that's nice and neatly contained that can stay as it is and then we've got some pitinia cordata um, which again is looking a little bit worse for wear I don't need to keep you know half of these plants um, so I'm going to retain what I want to keep for the remainder of the job and I'll make sure that they're kept moist. Just going to use a little foldable gardening saw and literally hack these up into little sections. I've lost my saw now. Who ever thought painting a gardening saw camouflage green was a good idea? It needs the head seen too. Where is it? Hey, there it is. Ugh. More buckets. Right, this will keep them going for the next couple of weeks. Just keep an eye on the water levels. Keep it topped up when required. That'll do nicely. Right, I'm now off to go and salvage some rock. So I've just come back from my local landscaping centre, a company called Lindsay Clarks over in Church in Surrey. If you're local, check them out, they're a really great business. Nice and friendly, very chilled, and they've got all the materials you'll need for any sort of outdoor job. I've picked up a tonne load of York random walling. Um, I can hear my van groaning at the weight of this, so I'm going to get it unloaded now. But one of the big issues I've got with the job I'm doing now is access to the back garden obviously is very very restricted having to go straight through the house and because the garden is almost completely graveled there's not really anywhere to wash anything dirty so I've had to come home with my work today and I've brought back all the rock hand loading it off into my garden I'm going to jet wash it all off and then it will get loaded back into the van and taken back up to site so one tonne of rock is going to end up getting moved three or four times it all unloaded. 
now I've got a big pile of rocks to wash. When I was emptying the rock from my van, I had a fantastic sight. A hummingbird hawk moth had paid a visit to my garden and was playing around with the lavender. These guys are infrequent visitors to our shores, uh, more common in Europe, but obviously this warmer weather is bringing them across. Their wing speed is so fast that I couldn't capture it on the camera. But in reality, it really is a blur and they look just like a little hummingbird. A fantastic sight. So that's the rock all cleaned off. And I'm gonna to have to pick up that big pile, load it up in my van, unload it, and carry all of that through a house and into a back garden. Hurrah. There's a world first exclusive. Still yet to complete it. But here's a couple of sneaky shots of my pond at the moment and how it's looking. Another three or four days when I get the chance and I'll have that finished. I still haven't done the stepping stone and I still haven't completed the walling around the back. I've got another water blade to fit and some more wall over there. All of the coping to fit on top. The walling's gonna end up coming a lot higher at the back. Um, probably halfway the height of the fence, I reckon. And still got a stepping stone to do, so still got quite a lot. But I have a pond planted up. I've got 10 or so fish in there. They've actually spawned a couple of times. We've still got Casper. And I've got a few babies lurking around in here. So I can't wait to see it finished. So there you go, you saw it here first. Good morning, fast forward a few days and the good people of Gordon Lowe have dispatched and sent us the new pond liner and fleece. So today's job is going to be to fit the new pond liner, but before we do that, we're going around tamping down the edging of the pond work, making sure that there are no obvious lumps and bumps and things that might damage the liner. It's a hot day, a hot morning. I'm feeling a bit tired. I could do with a decent night's sleep. It's been so hot at night time, it's not doing me any favors. So I'm just enjoying the relative peace and quiet this morning before all hell breaks loose when we put this horrible white fleece in this hole. Sunglasses to the ready, Let's crack on. Whew. That's good. So that's the pond fleece in. This is the protective layer to ensure that there's no sharp objects that can come through and damage the liner from beneath. We've kept the old pond fleece that was here originally because actually that was in really good condition. So that's beneath this and then we put a new fleece on top. Now it's time, thankfully, to put the pond liner in. I'm not sure what's worse, this really bright white reflective material or the black pond liner, which is going to get absolutely boiling to touch in this sun. <sighs> this is a bit more pleasant splashing around in here. I've got my ultimate fashion accessories on, a pair of Crocs. It's a bit too hot on the pond liner for bare feet. And it's certainly far too hot for a pair of waders. So we're just in like this. And now it's filling. I'm just going around and making sure that I've got some neat folds. As you start to fill the pond, the liner very obviously wants to crease at certain places. And so then it's a, an opportunity to start pulling it up and creating these neat folds. So as the pond fills and the water pressure holds it back, these folds are as discreet as possible. 
And as we're filling and as I've created these folds, I'm just sort of holding them in place for the time being with some weights, with some stones, just until the pond fills up. And you tend to find that the most obvious folds occur on the inside of a, of a corner or inside of a curve. And then I like to try to gather the fold so that we've got a pretty vertical crease rather than an angled one. And then once you've created a gather, that needs to continue all the way up to the outer edge of the pond liner. There we go, once that's held in place, that's gonna be nice and neat. I'm just being cautious here, using some, some flat stones, bricks, pebbles, anything like that, but nothing which is sharp or potentially could damage the pond liner. And this is just there temporarily as the pond is filling. Oh, that's getting hot. All right, we'll wait for a bit more water to pull this bit of pond liner down, and then we'll continue with some more creasing a little later on. Well, as lovely as this is, I can't put it off any further. We've got half a ton of rock in the back of the van, which needs to be hand loaded piece by piece through the house, being very careful not to drop anything on a nicely tiled floor and brought up into the garden. So it's still toe cap boots back on and time to get a bit hot and sweaty. Well, this has got to be the slowest way I've ever unloaded a load of rock from the van. The only respite is we've got a cold pond to jump into afterwards. So the pond's being filled up to just above the shelf level. Now normally I'd like to fill it right up to the top, but in this instance I haven't got enough space or capacity to then hold the water when I bump it back out of the pond and I wouldn't want to waste it. So I've just put enough in to make sure the liner is seated properly. We're going to drain it back down to just below this rock shelf. Um, and we should have enough capacity in our bowser right down at the bottom there on the patio to be able to hold this small volume of water that we're going to be pumping out so we don't waste it. We brought up a load of rock. Each one of these has been carried by hand through the house and up the garden. Setting up a little station to do some cutting because a lot of these rocks are going to be too big. They're going to span too much of that shelf so I can cut them in half and we can double up on the materials. But of course cutting is going to make a lot of mess, so that's going to get done over here. All of our sand and cement mixing, we're going to be using the traditional sand and cement method here to bond the rocks, not the foam. That's all going to get done up here and we'll just mix small quantities with the paddle mix on demand. In these kind of temperatures we don't want any mortar to be sitting there in the bucket, it's going to go off far too quickly. So, today we're going to start building. <laughs> 